Chapter 2 The room was small and dark, stinking of moldering weeds and rank liquids. Tangles of mangy animal pelts hung from hooks fixed to the walls and overhead beams, alongside the severed claws of birds and bundles of dried herbs. The few walls not given over to such macabre oddities were dominated by shelves alternately filled with clay jars and glass bottles, or else by bundles of parchment scrolls and leather-bound books, their pages slowly conspiring to free themselves of their rotted bindings. Illumination came from a bronze, bowl-like lamp resting upon a surface of a long table of unfinished timber. Men clustered about that lamp, disturbed by the weird decor of the magician's workshop, their eyes turning away from the reassuring flame to consider the wicker cages that formed a part of that decor and the small croaking things that scrabbled and clawed at the bars. Two of the men, however, did not share in the discomfort of the others. One of these was the unacknowledged leader of the others, a tall rakish man in black armor. His eyes did not stray to the darkness, nor the weird and unnatural bric-a-brac of the room. His attention was focused solely upon the man seated at the table, inspecting the slender ivory artifact set before him. Gobineau was no less intimidated than his men by the aura of menace that pulsated from the walls of the wizard's study, that indeed seemed to be exuded by the very wizard himself. But he was too old a scoundrel, too veteran a thief, to allow his unease to disorder him. He had taken many a pilfered necklace or stolen ring to fences in his time, and knew that studying the face, trying to read the thoughts of the man who was appraising the goods, was every bit as important as the theft itself. Instinct told him that in the present circumstances, there was no difference between the wizard and the fence, and that his hopes for a tidy profit might rest upon his observations. The wizard in question was seated, his intense gaze fixated upon the strange object Gobineau had brought to him. At times, the wizard would turn his attention to one of several decrepit books he had set beside him at the table. Gobineau peered at one of the books, the one which the wizard consulted the most, seeing that it appeared to be written in two different scripts, the flowing graceful symbols of the elves, and the much more angular and harsh letters of Reichspiel. The wizard's long spidery fingers slithered among the pages, rummaging among them as he inspected the carvings that covered the ivory cylinder and its silver base. The wizard's name was Rudel, and like Gobineau, he was garbed in black, a long flowing robe of fine cloth that was wrapped about his lean frame as though woven from shadows and the darkest hours of the night. As the wizard had descended the stairs that led from the tower above into his workshop to receive his petitioners, it had seemed as though stars had twinkled from within the depths of his garment. A skullcap of dark blue cloth rested upon his head, bound about the brow by a silver circlet adorned at the center by a polished piece of moonstone. Upon the breast of the robe, the golden outline of a comet had been woven. The man beneath the robe was thin, of no great stature or strength. Yet even so, Gobineau could recall few men who had presented so intimidating an impression. The wizard's skin was dark, betraying his foreign blood, carrying with it the swarthiness of the southern empire and lands such as Averland and Wissenland. His hair was black, and despite the evident age in the wizard's face, it was as dark and lustrous as any Gobineau had ever seen, without even the faintest suggestion of grey and silver. Rudolf's features were hard, a thin, cruel mouth that was locked in a perpetual smirk of sinister amusement, a narrow, knife-like nose, and two dark eyes that gleamed with all the feverish obsession of a weird root addict. Even the wizard's hands were unsettling, 
the fingers long and thin, like two pale spiders rather than human hands. As the wizard continued his examination, he glanced up at Gobineau. The bandit licked his lips nervously as their eyes met, and it seemed to him that a smirk became slightly greater as Rudol returned to his study. Rudol had been a promising student of the Empire's Colleges of Magic, before impatience and ambition had earned him the distrust and enmity of his instructors. He had been kicked out for his reckless refusals to accept a caution and restraint the elder wizards were forever trying to drive home to their students. It had been as good as a death sentence, for Rudol knew that those who were banished from the colleges always attracted the dangerous attention of the witch hunters, who hunted down most zealously any who delved into the forbidden arts without official patronage. So it was that Rudol had been forced to flee his homeland, staying one step ahead of the witch hunters as he rode for lands beyond their reach, the green and pleasant realms of Bretonia. Of course, he had not done so empty-handed. The better part of one of his instructor's personal libraries had found its way into Rudolf's keeping. Some day, Rudolf had promised himself he would return to Altdorf and collect the rest of the library. The green and pleasant realms of Bretonia had not offered much to further his ambitions. True, he had eluded the witch hunters, who seldom ventured into the lands claimed by the king of Bretonia but he found himself a foreigner in a land where even its natives were gripped in a hideous and perpetual poverty. He could find employment with none of the noble lords he had offered his services to, dismissed alternatively as a beggar, a charlatan, or worse, hounded across the countryside as an imperial spy if the knights proved particularly paranoid and distrustful of outsiders. Denied the patronage of nobility, Rudol had been forced to eke out a living off the peasants, people who had little enough for themselves, much less enough to pay for the services of a wizard. For twenty years, Rudol had found himself crushed beneath the same system of poverty that kept the peasants of Bretonia in a state often worse than the conditions in which they kept their cattle and swine. He found himself keeping frost from fields for nothing more than a few bowls of soup and a wedge of cheese, calling up rainstorms for a handful of copper coins and perhaps a live chicken or two. And yet, amidst the peasants, even so poor a wage made him wealthy, respected and feared. The small two-story stone tower in which he dwelled had been built on that fear, constructed by the villagers during the long hours of the night, after they had returned from their herds and their fields, fearful that the wizard might place a curse upon them should they refuse his demands. Rudolf smiled as he remembered the event. He had felt a little taste of the power he desired that night. But it would be no peasant rabble who would cower before him. It would be his own peers, the wizards who had cast him out from the Celestial College in Altdorf. They would repay Rudol for the years of misery he had endured, the hardships he had been made to suffer. They would hail him as the greatest of their order and confess their jealousy and envy, even as they groveled in the dirt and pleaded for his forgiveness. The wizard's eyes turned once more to the pages of the book laid out beside him. It was a translation of many of the characters used in the elven Elfarin language into the more readily understandable letters of the wizard's native Reichspiel. With every step in his translation of the story carved upon the piece of ivory, Rudolf's pulse quickened and his breath sharpened, hardly daring to believe what he was reading. The artifact was ancient, predating the establishment of Bretonia and even Sigmar himself, preserved from the ravages of time by the lingering magic of the elves, with which they protected most of what they made. The carved characters told a story, an ancient moment from a vanished time. It was a tragic story of an elf prince 
who fell during the legendary war between the elves and dwarves that had raged while the tribes of the Empire still wore the skins of beasts and hid inside caves. The prince had been a great warrior and leader among his people, and he had commanded the worms of the earth to serve him and carry him to victory in battle. Rudol let a sharp gasp escape as he considered what the importance of that might mean. Could it be? Could it truly be? He had read legends, legends related to the elves of Marienburg, about a potent talisman used by the elves to summon dragons, to bind the mighty reptiles to their will. It had been called the Fell Fang, to give its closest Reichspiel translation, and legend said it had been lost when its princely owner had fallen in battle with the dwarves. Could the lord spoken of on the ivory cylinder have been the wielder of the fabulous talisman? Another thrill swept up the wizard's spine as he considered another part of the old legend, that which referred to the size of the magical artifact. The object resting before him matched very closely the dimensions given in the elf legend. There was only one problem, and the excitement bled out of Rudel as he considered it. The stories were adamant about the material from which the fell fang had been crafted. The talisman had been made from the tooth of a dragon. The object he had been studying was unquestionably whale ivory, the sort of scrimshaw often worked by the so-called sea elves on their long voyages. Rudolf's brow knitted for a moment as he considered the quandary. He stared intently at the cylinder, bringing one of the strange crystal lenses he had liberated from the Celestial College to bear upon the object. The wizard studied every inch of the artifact once again, this time ignoring the translations of the engravings and concentrating upon the surface itself. He laughed with joy as his closer scrutiny revealed a minuscule gap between the ivory and the silver cap that formed its base. You have discovered something? Gobineau inquired, reacting to the wizard's sudden excitement. It's hollow! Rudel exclaimed. The words electrified the observing bandits, each of the brigands drawing still closer to the table, thoughts of hidden treasure vanquishing their uneasiness. Rudel ignored the eager anticipation of the men around him, seemingly oblivious to their presence, his long slender fingers slipping among the engravings, pressing upon them. I have seen this sort of thing before. The wizard spoke, his words directed at no one. It is like a Cathayan puzzle box. The question is, how does it open? The wizard's fingers continued to press and pry at the elaborate engravings upon the ivory cylinder and its silver cap. Gabineau watched every movement, eyes locked upon the mystic's crawling fingers. He heard the faintest click as Rudolf's index finger stabbed at a small, sickle-shaped symbol upon the silver ring. The wizard laughed again, tugging the ivory cylinder free. Gobineau had never seen such a look of greedy rapture as the one that flashed across Rudolf's face when the wizard laid eyes upon the thing which had been hidden within the cylinder. The artifact was like a reliquary, like the small silver boxes in which pious peasants might carry the finger bone of a saint or a lock cut from the hair of one of the lady's holy damsels. But the thing which had been hidden within the artifact had never come from any man, however holy or heroic. Nor had it been part of an elf, however ancient and fabulous. It was a six-inch curve of blackened bone, its tip sharp as a dagger even after so many centuries. The surface of the bone was pitted in many places by deep holes, each of the holes ringed in some light, shiny metal that was unknown to Gobineau and his men. Just as the cylinder had been hollow, so too was the object it contained. An evil, sickly smell seemed to fill the room as Rudolf exposed the thing, 
and Gobineau started to feel hot with excitement. Magnificent! Rudol gasped. It is true! The wizard's fingers caressed the blackened relic, as though exploring the soft skin of a beautiful woman. Then we have found a very valuable treasure? Gobineau inquired, intruding upon the wizard's glee. Valuable? Rudol scoffed, so lost in his discovery that his words came without thought. It is beyond value. A king's ransom would be but a trifle next to the value of this. All the gold in the grey mountains would be but a pittance to the worth of this. Rudol snapped out of his reverie, looking up at the hungry faces staring at him, noting the greedy gleam of the bandit's eyes. Of course I speak from the view of a scholar, Rudol explained, his voice uneven. It would command no great price from someone who was not interested in such things. The wizard elaborated weakly. He rose from the table, the artifact still gripped in his hand. Gobineau reached forward, grabbing hold of the relic, before the wizard could remove it. For a moment, Brigand and Mystic stared at one another, each clutching the relic. At length, with an almost apologetic shrug, Rudol relented, allowing Gobineau to reclaim the ivory cylinder. Naturally, you should be paid something for your efforts, Rudol explained as he walked towards a section of shelving that lined the wall behind him. For the value of the silver, if nothing else, he continued. Gobineau watched the mage, the hair on the back of his neck starting to stand on end. He observed Rudol remove a leather bag from behind the brass astrolabe, the distinct and familiar chink of coins striking against one another, sounding as the wizard lifted a pouch. Perhaps three gold crowns would serve as recompense? Rudol asked. Alone among the bandits, Gobineau looked away from the money bag Rudol held towards them, observing the wizard's other hand. The long spidery fingers were twitching and clawing in an elaborate series of motions. Gobineau cursed himself for a fool and threw himself to the floor. He'd let his greed get the better of him, allowed it to overcome his natural caution. He hadn't appreciated that Rudel might decide to keep the elven artifact for himself. And, most disastrous of all, he'd momentarily forgotten that a strange old man was much more than a strange old man. He'd failed to keep at the forefront of his mind that Rudel was a wizard. The bounty hunter slowly slogged his way down the muddy lane that formed the main road of Albanac. Peasants hurried out from his path, seeking the safety of doorways from which to peer in surprise and dread at the armored figure and his foreign garb. Simple, hard-working folk, most of them had never been more than a few miles from their village, and the only warriors they had ever seen were the resplendent knights, who were both their lords and protectors. The man now striding down the narrow strip of mire was something different. His garb disheveled and without the flamboyant heraldry of a knight. His weapons were strange, devices that none of the onlookers could quite figure out but which they decided were deadly all the same. The eyes that stared out from the visor of his plane, unadorned helm, were like chips of ice, more like the eyes of a wolf than the eyes of a man. There was an air of menace about a man, a smell of blood and death, more than enough to make the quiet folk of Valbanek keep their distance. Brunner paid little attention to the frightened faces of the villagers. Their fear would keep the peasants from getting in his way. He'd hate to accidentally kill someone he wasn't going to be paid for. The bounty hunter paused as he saw the spire of a tower. It was only two floors, and yet even so it was the tallest building in the village. The lower floor was built of stone, unworked blocks of granite, crudely fitted together. The upper floor crouched above it, like the cap of a toadstool, 
and was built of timber. It was like a coarse parody of the sort of place a merchant of the empire might make his home, an unrefined copy of the sort of tower in which a real wizard would lair. Brunner glanced away from the tower, eyeing the pistol holstered across his belly, ensuring that the cap was still fitted to it. Then the bounty hunter caressed the heavy wood and steel frame of his repeating crossbow. With any luck, he would disable most of Gabineau's friends before it came to swordplay. Of course, he'd have to spare the bandit leader the worst of his attentions. No bullet or crossbow bolt for him. The bounty on Gabineau, at least the largest one being offered, the only one that was of interest to Brunner, specified that there was a deduction of 500 gold crowns if the villain was brought in dead. The Reichlander had no intention of being wasteful. As the bounty killer studied the small tower, examining it for alternate means of entry, by which his quarry might effect an escape, a sudden commotion sounded from within the structure. It had sounded like an explosion of some sort, punctuated by the cries and wails of several men. Brunner spat into the dust, running toward the tower at a brisk jog. Perhaps this Rudel was less charlatan and more genuine wizard than he had presumed. Perhaps the bounty hunter wasn't the only one interested in the price on Gobineau's head. Amidst such desperate poverty as he'd seen in Valbonek, Brunner could see even a wizard lending his abilities to more mercenary purposes. Not that it mattered. No one was going to get between Brunner and his quarry. Not even a wizard. The room was a shambles. Scrolls fluttering across the floor. Feathers spinning slowly after being ripped from the bizarre collection of croaking birds that nestled amongst the wizard's cages. Gobineau found himself lying upon his back, sprawled beneath a smelly old wolfskin that had been torn from where it had been nailed to an overhead beam. Blood drizzled from his nose, his cheek also lacerated by the heavy pewter cup that had crashed into his face. The brigand pulled a white cloth from his belt, trying to stem the flow of crimson before it had a chance to stain his garments. Moaning voices sounded from all around him, telling Gobineau that his men were likewise alive, if not unharmed. Rudel stood behind the table, glaring at the men with an expression that was as much a thing of contempt as it was annoyance. The wizard held his hand extended before him, the fingers splayed so that they formed something that resembled the claw of a vulture. It had been from that hand that the power had struck. Gobineau had once numbered piracy amongst his catalogue of crimes, preying upon fat merchantmen as they tried to slip into the port city of Marienburg. What had exploded within the wizard's room had been every bit as fierce and terrible as any gale borne over the Sea of Claws, a blast of howling wind and invisible might that had smashed everything and everyone before it. Then, as suddenly as it had struck, the burst of wind had ceased, only the destruction it had wrought, giving evidence that it had indeed occurred. Gobineau fancied that he could see a weird light slowly fading from Rudel's eyes, a wan blue energy that chilled the bandit's fry-scursed soul. Rudel's lip curled into a sneer as he returned the brigand's gaze. You fools! he snapped. You dare think you can cheat Rudel of what he desires? The fingers of his outstretched hand closed into a white-knuckled fist, which the wizard shook angrily at the stunned bandits. You have felt but the smallest measure of my power. Give me cause and I shall destroy each and every one of you. The wizard snarled, turning his fist toward the door. He extended his index finger, and by his command, the heavy wooden portal crashed inward, ripped open by unseen hands. Live, while I am still of a mind to let you live. Rudol ordered, 
the words brooking no defiance. Gobineau turned his head to see the least shaken of his men already on their feet and sprinting toward the door. He turned his head back toward Rudel as he heard the wizard laugh derisively and reached toward the artifact still lying upon the table. The bandit cast aside his blood-soaked rag, ripping the sword from his belt as he leapt to his feet. Gobineau roared at his fleeing henchman, putting all the command he could in his tones. Will you let this charlatan swine steal our fortune from us, lads? The look the wizard turned upon him almost froze Gobineau's heart, yet the rogue continued to shout his defiance. He is no waste, spawn demon. Prick his hide and he bleeds red like any other thief. What effect, if any, Gobineau's words might have had on his men was uncertain and irrelevant. As the first of the brigands who regained their feet reached the door, they found their path blocked by a grim figure in armor. The foremost of the men found his belly caving in under the short punch delivered by the armored warrior's fist. The bandit crumpled to the ground, his last meal splashing on the wall. The man behind him hesitated, eyes wide with fright, hand fumbling for the blade thrust through his animal gut belt. The sword was never drawn, however, for the warrior blocking the doorway lifted the heavy crossbow gripped in his right hand and sent a steel bolt crunching its way through the Bretonian skull. Ronald's Grace! Gobineau heard one of his henchmen cry out as he sighted the killing machine that now strode into Rudolf's workshop. It's Brunner! If the blood god himself had clawed his way into the room, Gabineau didn't think the other bandit's voice could have been more filled with terror. Observing the heavy crossbow the notorious bounty hunter held in his hands, Gabineau dropped back onto the floor he had so recently risen from. He was not ignorant of the price offered for his head, even if he did treat it with a boastful contempt. For someone like Brunner to be in a hog hole like Valbanek, there could be only one reason, and Gobineau was not terribly pleased by the prospect. Instead, he shouted at the top of his voice, There's Rudel! He's the one you want! The words did nothing to distract the bounty killer, who was already singling out Gobineau from the other bandits that cringed behind the room's wrecked furniture. Gobineau hadn't expected it to. The wizard, however, was another matter. Rudel had heard the terror with which Gobineau's man had named the armored newcomer, and Gobineau was willing to bet that a wizard from the Empire living in poverty and exile did not do so without a few skeletons in his past. Skeletons that might have long memories and thick purses. Rudel snarled, spitting a string of foul words that seemed to sear the air. His hand crackled with a wild ribbon of light, a rope of electricity that the wizard sent streaking toward the bounty hunter. Brunner reacted far more quickly than Rudel had anticipated, hitting the floor and rolling behind the central column that supported the floor above. The lightning bolt swerved as it snaked about the room, exploding against the column that was now between it and its intended victim. The stone sizzled and blackened under the impact, shrieking like a banshee. The bounty hunter was unfazed, however, darting from behind his cover to fire a bolt from his weapon in Rudolf's direction. The missile missed the wizard's neck by a hair's breadth, chipping the stone wall behind Rudel as it impacted. You shall die for trifling with me, Rudel shouted, his words almost unintelligible as his accent contorted them. One of Gabineau's men sprang from cover, hurling himself toward the door. The wizard reacted to the motion, sending another bolt of lightning from his clawed hand. The electrical discharge slammed into the fleeing bandit, his scream reaching such a pitch 
that Gobineau was certain the man's vocal cords must snap. The stench of ozone and seared flesh filled the room as a jagged black hole was bored through the bandit's torso. The man fell against the floor with a meaty impact, acrid smoke rising from the ghastly wound. Once again, Brunner emerged from his cover to fire on the wizard, taking advantage of the distraction presented by the unfortunate brigand. The repeating crossbow sounded once more, the steel bolt hurling towards Rudolf's chest. Once again, the missile missed its target by the merest fraction, burying itself in the splintered wood of the wizard's table. This time Gabineau was certain of something he thought he had only imagined when the bounty hunter had missed his first shot. The pattern of stars on Rudolf's cloak had shifted, moving across the black cloth. Gobineau's flesh crawled at this further manifestation of Rudolf's black arts. The wizard retaliated once more, a snake of lightning punching a hole through the rear wall of the workshop, narrowly missing the bounty hunter as he dove for the shelter of an appended barrel. Rudol snarled again, a thick Averland curse, and sent another streak of lightning blasting into the barrel, causing it to explode in a shower of splinters and melted iron. But Brunner was already rolling across the floor, taking shelter once more behind the sanctuary offered by the support column. Gobineau! The rogue turned as he heard his name called out. He glanced over to where the last of his bandits had found cover. The man shouted to be heard above the sizzle of lightning as Rudol sent bolt after bolt slamming into the column. We've got to get out of here, the bandit called. No, while well, they're trying to kill each other. A capital suggestion, Gabineau remarked amazed that someone thought it necessary to voice something so painfully obvious. Why don't you go first, pig sticker? The rogue called back. The other bandit muttered a short prayer to Ranald, then made the sign of the lady for good measure, and broke from his shelter, scrambling on his hands and knees until he was across the threshold and out into the street. Still frenziedly assaulting the stone column, Rudol paid the brigand's departure not even the slightest notice. Gobineau braced himself for a quick sprint for the door, chancing a last look back at the enraged wizard. The brigand chief's eyes fell away from Rudol and the magic lightning crackling from his hand, drawn instead to the ivory cylinder lying upon the table. Gobineau smiled as a new idea fixed itself in his mind. No reason why I should live empty-handed, the rogue observed. He crawled across the floor until his legs were beneath the timber table. He braced himself and with a double kick of both feet upended the table, spilling it onto Rudol. Gobineau heard a mage cry out as the table struck him down, but the rogue did not linger to see what damage he had done. His hand closed upon the ivory reliquary that had been sent skittering across the floor. Laughing, Gabineau scrambled to his feet and sprinted for the door, back bent so low as to present the smallest possible target, should the wizard have already recovered, and keeping one wary eye on the badly damaged support column. He might have incapacitated Rudol, but that would be small comfort should a crossbow bolt from the bounty hunter's weapon dig into his chest. The dreaded shot did not come, however. Instead, there was a loud explosion and a bright flash of blue light. Gabineau risked a look back and shuddered at what he saw. Rudel had freed himself from the timber table, splinters of wood surrounding him, oily black smoke slowly spiraling from the debris. The wizard's black cloak fluttered about him, the cloth whipping about in an unnatural breeze. Crackling energy snaked about Rudel's body, filling the air with a smell of ozone. The mage's eyes had gone white, lost within the eerie power that now filled his frame. 
the exile's face was contorted into an embodiment of pitiless hate and rage. His clawed hands gestured, sending rapid blasts of lightning flickering in every direction, disintegrating wood and cracking stone. You thieves! You scum! The maddened Rudel was shouting, The Felfang is mine! As the wizard continued his merciless assault, heavy wooden beams groaned overhead, and clouds of dust fell from the ceiling. Gobineau could see the badly damaged support column shudder and moan, the horrific sight snapping him from the fascinated paralysis that had gripped him. With a leap worthy of a mountain goat, Gobineau jumped through the doorway and out onto the street. Behind him, Rudel looked upwards, the color returning to his eyes as the energy drained from him. His pupils dilated with fear as the entire structure began to tremble. Hastily, he started to shout out in a strange language, words that no human throat was ever meant to utter. Even as he raised his arms up to make arcane gestures, the ravaged support column, unable to bear the weight of the rooms above, cracked and flew apart, followed a second later by the entirety of the upper floor and the timbered roof. Gobineau burst into the street, a cloud of dust billowing out behind him as the wizard's tower collapsed in upon itself. The outer walls no longer able to stand without the bracing support of the floors within. The bandits scudded through the mire of the street, then turned to face the structure that had so very nearly become his tomb. He looked away from the pile of wreckage, considering his torn and stained clothing. Damn poor taste, he muttered, as he considered the long gash that had manifested in the sleeve of his tunic. Then he considered the ivory cylinder still clutched in his hand, and laughed heartily. I can buy new clothes, he concluded. A sound from behind him made the rogue spin around in alarm, his free hand pulling out his sword. He chuckled again, when he found that it was only the other remaining members of the gang. You got it, commented Pigsticker. The greasy bandit's eyes were once again displaying the cold gleam of greed that had shown within them when the bandits had overheard Rudel's appraisal of the artifact. Gobineau shot an angry look at the man, but quickly let it slip into a friendly smile. Gobineau did not favor confrontations that were two to one, or even confrontations with more equitable odds, unless the other party involved had their back to him. We're rich, lads, Gobineau exclaimed, casting another lingering look at a pile of rubble that had so lately been Rudolf's tower. The world is now our oyster. He nodded back toward the wreckage. But let's discuss our fortune a good distance from this place. I half expect that mad wizard to dig his way out of there. What about Brunner? wheezed the third brigand, his breathing still short from the brutal blow the bounty killer had introduced to the man's stomach. I wouldn't put it past him to dig his way out of there either. Gobineau agreed. More reason for us to get a long way from here. He pointed a finger at the brigand. Ducks, you go and get the horses from the stables. Big Sticker and I will meet you at a mill just outside the village. Gobineau watched as Ducks hurried across the street, still clutching at his belly. When the bandit was out of earshot, he turned to his remaining confederate. There's a stable at the southern end of the village. I suggest we go and relieve him of his two fastest horses and make ourselves scarce. Gobineau did not wait for the other bandit to commend, but slipped into the alley that wormed its way between the mud-walled hovels. The other bandit hurried after him. Why are we going to steal more horses? Pig Sticker complained. 
We already have some. Gobineau smiled at the other thief's lack of foresight. Tell me, from everything you've heard about him, do you think Brunner would let himself get crushed beneath a wizard's disintegrating mans? The other bandit paused, his bleary eyes deep in thought. You think he's alive? Pigsticker asked. Gobineau shrugged his shoulders by way of reply, kicking at the foremost of a gaggle of geese that was blocking the path of the two thieves. The birds hissed angrily, but diverted their march. Who knows, but I'd rather err on the side of caution, Gobineau told him. Something to do with the rather extreme value I place upon my own neck. The rogue stopped, turning to look at his companion. You're a bounty hunter, who has tracked down his prey. The only problem is that they just happen to be in the process of being cooked alive by a mad wizard. The smart man cuts his losses, slips away and hopes his mark makes it out in one piece so he can be caught later. Gobineau smiled, an expression of calculating admiration. From what I hear, this Brunner is a very cagey sort. He'd probably figure that if any of us made it out of here, we'd head for our horses, straight as an arrow. Gobineau chuckled darkly. I'm betting he's waiting there right now. Pig Sticker surged forward his calloused hand closing about the neck of Gobineau's tunic. The larger bandit slammed the rogue against the mud wall of the hovel they were standing beside. And you sent docks there to get killed? Pig Sticker accused. Not at all, Gobineau replied, his voice strained as he tried to suck in a full breath. I sent him there to buy us time. If Brunner is there, and he sees only ducks, he might figure ducks was the only one who made it out of there. Meanwhile, you and I are sneaking away in the other direction. The rogue's calculating words gave the other bandit pause. Pig Sticker slowly released his hold on the dapper brigand. Gobineau tried to smooth out the wrinkles caused by the bandit's clutch. I know people in Musillon who will pay quite nicely for what we have here, Gobineau told the other bandit. And I'd rather split a hole two ways rather than three. Pig Sticker smiled back at the rogue, nodding in agreement. Fifteen minutes later, Pig Sticker sat slumped on the ground, his head lolling against his breast, eyes locked on the dark liquid spilling from his belly. He looked up as he heard a horse trot close by. The dying bandit's face twisted with hate as he recognized the rider as Gobineau. The rogue threw him a mocking salute. Many thanks for your help dealing with a farmer, Gobineau called down to his former comrade. He slapped the flank of his new horse. They really do raise some fine animals in this area. The rogue sighed deeply, turning the head of his animal so that the horse began to trot away. It's a pity you can't come with me, Gobineau called back. But sadly, I prefer not to split loot at all, than split it two ways. The dying bandit watched his treacherous companion ride off, Fury and rage suddenly overcoming even the cold chill of death pulling at his limbs. Pig Sticker was unusual for a Bretonian. He could read and write after a fashion, a skill he had learned during a brief legitimate phase as a warehouse warden in Languil. Now he put that half-remembered skill to use, dipping his fingers into the pool of bubbling crimson that covered him. Pig Sticker stabbed his fingers into the dirt beside him, slowly, one by one, drawing the letters that would betray his betrayer. It was nearly sunset when the bounty hunter found the body of Pig Sticker on the outskirts of the village. 
Brunner's scrutinizing gaze took in the gruesome scene, reading at once the story it told. The bandit had been stabbed at close quarters and from the front, the wound too small for that of a sword, more likely the work of a knife or a dagger. The bandit's own weapons remained in their sheaves. Quite clearly, the blow had been unexpected. Unexpected because it had come from a man the bandit had fought to be his friend. A belly wound such as that would give the dying bandit a long time to consider the treachery of his murderer. It was with a smile of triumph that Brunner read the words the dying brigand had painted into the dirt with his own blood. It was the name of a place, the place to which, undoubtedly, his killer was heading. Brunner had already gone through much trouble to find his prey. The battle with the wizard had been one the bounty hunter had been utterly unprepared for. Had it not been for Gobineau's timely distraction, Brunner might have not had the opportunity to escape, diving through a hole blown in the rear wall of the tower by one of the wizard's lightning bolts. The bounty hunter had then hastened to the stables to await the arrival of any survivors from the bandit gang as they tried to reclaim their animals. There had been only one, and not the man he was after. But the bandit had confirmed that Gobineau had escaped from the wizard and that the rogue was to meet him at the old mill. When Gabineau had not been where the bandit had said he would be, Brunner had guessed at the rogue's cunning and duplicity, quickly riding a circuit around the village in the hopes of catching Gabineau's trail. That had led him to Pigsticker, and the simple message the man had left behind. The bounty hunter considered again the name and the place it represented. There were few places that Brunner hesitated to go, however, it seemed that his prey was making for one of them, the haunted, decaying city of Musilon. Brunner let his gloved hand slip to the hilt of the headsman. Gobineau was clever in his way, but if he thought a little thing like hiding in the most reviled place in all Bretonia was going to help him, then the rogue was going to quickly discover that his cleverness had run its course. The wind wailed and moaned through the tiny copse of trees, causing the scattered leaves to crackle and spin. Had anyone been there to observe it, they might have marveled at the strange motion of air, a spiral of force that was contrary to the light breeze that moved the tops of the trees. The weird motion of air began to intensify, stripping loose bark from the trunks of the poplars, uprooting grass from the fragile soil. As the spirals of force became still more intense, it seemed they became visible, glowing with a pale blue light. The spectral display intensified until its brilliance seemed to rival the sun. Then it was gone, force and wind and glow. In its place, Amid the stripped bark and uprooted vegetation, there stood a figure garbed in black. The wizard turned his body, staring with eyes that were pools of fury, at a distant cluster of poverty that was Valbanek. Rudolf's lip twisted in a spiteful sneer, and his long-fingered hand spread into a claw, then snapped close into a clenched fist, as though crushing the village within his grip. They had called him too emotional for proper mastery of the arts of wizardry and magic, too given to excess and the free reign of his emotion. The masters of the Celestial College spoke of restraint, of carefully measuring the power a wizard called into himself, of letting that power be used with care and caution, lest it run wild and beyond the magic wielder's control. It galled Rudel to no end that they were right. He was given to excess, given to allowing his emotions to overwhelm him, letting his anger, rather than his intellect, direct the power he took from the winds of magic. In his tower, he'd allowed the celestial energies to almost overwhelm him, allowed them to destroy indiscriminately, allowed the power to build to such a level that it might have consumed him. 
Rudel had seen what could happen if a wizard allowed too much magic to gather in his blood. The lucky ones would die, exploding in a brilliant blaze of light, or simply dropping as though poleaxed by an ogre. There were others who survived such things, their bodies consumed and degenerated by the awesome energies that had run rampant through their systems. Spawn, they called them, living manifestations of the dread force that was father to all magic, chaos. Rudel's limbs trembled, unsteady and weak from the energies that had crackled about them. With a fumbling hand, the wizard opened a pouch on his belt, removing a small clay file of filthy, tar-like liquid. The substance's narcotic smell steadied Rudel's hand, and the wizard lifted the tiny bottle to his lips, letting his tongue lap some of the syrupy liquid from its container. At once, the calming effect of the drug surged through the wizard's wasted veins, calming twitching muscles and throbbing nerves. Essence of weird root was not easy to come by, especially in Britonia, where the knights were quick to punish those reckless enough to grow the forbidden herb, punishment that as often as not meant quartering for the criminal. Yet it was a vital substance, an essential tool to maintaining Rudel's prowess with the black arts, keeping the wizard from reducing himself to a seizure-ridden cripple after one of his zealous magical outbursts. The spell he had used, one that allowed the caster to vanish from one place and translocate himself to another, was a dangerous one, which called upon different winds of magic. To draw upon more than one of the colors of sorcery increased the risk of allowing too much chaotic power to build within the wizard's body. Even a reckless man of Rudel's temperament hesitated to risk such things, yet there had been no other way to escape his crumbling abode save to embrace that risk and employ the grey magic he had learned so long ago. The wizard turned his gaze toward the south. He could sense it, the fell fang, being carried away by the filthy bandit scum who had brought it to him. The thief no doubt was unaware of the glamour Rudel had placed upon the artifact when he had guessed what it was. So long as the spell was maintained, Rudel would know exactly where the coveted relic was. It would not be long before he tracked down the snickering brigand. Rudel considered his options. He could, of course, try to kill the bandit and whatever confederates he had with him when the time came. But if he did that, he ran the risk of allowing the power to run away with him again. The fell fang was much too important to risk losing forever due to an excess of magic and his own impatience. No, he would be better served by securing swordsmen of his own, blades to cut down Gobino and his trash, while Rudel relieved the scum of their treasure. He would need an ally, a patron in this matter. The wizard's sinister laughter cackled into the night. He had a good idea where to find such a patron, a man ruthless enough to support the wizard's schemes, so long as Rudel led him to believe that he too would profit by them. He looked south again, imagining the fleeing Gobino, scuttling back into whatever spider hole he called his home. He hoped that the smiling rogue made good use of the days left to him, for they were most certainly numbered.